Hello, everyone, and welcome to Insight Edition. I'm so thankful you've joined us because we are here with Pastor Kent Christmas. He is the one who gave the prophecy about 2020, and we have already been seeing it come to pass. And so I'm excited to get his insight and for him to give it to us today. And so let's get right into it. Hello, Pastor Ken. How are you doing? I'm fantastic, Samantha. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so thankful that you're here and agreed to do this interview. And I want you to tell us, um, tell us the name of your church and when it started. Our uh, church is named Regeneration Nashville. Uh, we just recently changed the name from Resting Place uh, because I felt like we're done resting. And I believe that God is thrusting uh, his churches into purpose. So we're Regeneration Nashville. We are in our 13th year. That is amazing. That's wonderful. Tell me a little bit about your life before ministry. Well, um, it's hard to remember at this point. Uh, next year, I'll be preaching 50 years. So I started when I was 17. Uh, born in the church my dad was uh, a missionary here in the United States to the American Indian so I lived on an Indian reservation uh, got exposed a lot to uh, demonic warfare because their church uh, really in their mixture was Catholicism and witchcraft and so we saw a lot of uh, manifestations and the powers of darkness and yet we saw God do great things and so my father died when I was 12 and uh, answered the call to preach when I was 17. Um, pretty much self-taught. Uh, started full-time uh, evangelizing when I was 21. And drove a lot of miles in little cars to get to this point. That is a, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful testament to what you did driving around in those little cars. Yes. And now look where you are. That's, a, that's amazing. Um, tell me about how you got saved. Uh, you know, for people who are raised in the church, that's something that sometimes they have a hard time articulating. Uh, but I do remember it. I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I was nine years old and really had a divine encounter with God. And from that time on, uh, I think the thing that I remember the most uh, in my early years with the Lord was I had such a fear of the Lord, not in the sense of terror, but in the sense that I did not want to grieve him. Um, and always just had a hunger to be in the presence of God. I never really went out in the world. I was I never drank, smoked, uh, that type of thing. And so uh, being raised uh, in church, for me, especially in Pentecost, uh, gave me such a, an aptitude or an appetite for prayer. And I think uh, listening to all of those old saints and those prayer meetings and seeing God do the things that he did at an early age has kept me going and so you know I'm from a generation that probably lives on the remembering of the past and now I'm trying to teach a generation uh, to experience God for themselves and so um, being being saved is a wonderful thing and having the heritage of, of Pentecost in my life and the baptism of the Holy Ghost I guess I've had it for well, I'm 66, and I got him when I was nine, so I don't know, some, a lot of years. Wow, being nine years old and receiving yeah. the baptism of the Holy Spirit and having that hunger yes. already at that age. Can you tell me a little bit about being baptized in the Holy Ghost, about how um, that experience went for you? Do you remember it? Vividly? I do. Saturday night in a young people's service, and... Um, Nobody praying for me. It's, it's really interesting to see how different people uh, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, I just had my head down on my arms in the altar. Nobody praying for me and just begin to speak in a heavenly language. And so it seems to be indicative of my personality. Um, and um, never saw a light or had an angel show up. Just knew that God had come into my life and very, very grateful for it. I think that'll be an encouragement to a lot of people because sometimes we can, you know, expect to see that angel, sure. especially growing up in Pentecost. You mm -hmm. expect some some really big thing to happen, but it was just a gentle, just gentle for it you. It was. It was still small boys. That's wonderful. 
I also want to ask you this. You're the pastor of a large church, and I know that there are pastors out there who are struggling to grow their churches. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you would tell them, both spiritually and practically, on how to grow their church? Well, first of all, you got to know God called you to do it. Um, I don't think there's probably anything harder to do than pastor a church. If you're trying to build a church around the presence of God. Uh, I think our church could be much larger if we were willing to focus more on numbers uh, than the presence of the Lord. Uh, and then my church is a little bit different uh, because I'm very prophetic. And so I'm very black and white. And um, we, from the very beginning, we, when I began to start our church, the Lord spoke to me. He said, you're not starting a church, you're birthing a movement. And uh, we struggled for a lot of years trying to get our church off the ground. We started uh, with no money, no people, no building. Uh, I put up black plastic from Home Depot on cinder block walls in the warehouse that we used to feed the homeless and had a kerosene heater and um, about a $200 sound system. In my first service, I preached to two people. But I knew in my heart that, that God wanted us to do that. And one of the things the Lord told me, he said, you are building a church that will be a solution for a problem that does not yet exist. And uh, for a long, long time, America has not needed God. They're too blessed. And so um, we made the commitment that regardless of how long we stayed small or how hard we struggled, we would not sacrifice building our, our, our church around the presence of the Lord. And I think we're balanced. Um, you know, we're not running on top of pews and screaming and hollering and having fits. But at the same time, I've tried to teach our people to be uh, demonstrative in their worship. Raise your hands, you know, open your mouth. One of the things that's happened to the church today is the devil has put a muzzle on the mouth of Christians. And I noticed that, that when we have our corporate prayer meetings, um, I don't really like them uh, simply because it's difficult to get Christians to pray out loud. And so I'm on the platform, my wife's walking in front, and we're praying out loud, and I feel like everybody just hears what we're saying. And so I've tried to develop saints that have a personal relationship with the Lord that they lift up their voice. And that our worship services are not our choir giving a concert, but there are people uh, interacting and, you know, praising God and, and responding to the presence of the Lord. And so I think that probably every man and woman who is in a pastoral position in America who has really hungered for revival, I don't think it's been easy for them because the dynamics of the society that we live in um, is not conducive to that. I think the um, average Christian in a recent poll in America goes to church once every six weeks. This came from two different pastors. One had 30,000 in his church and one had a little over 20,000. And they hired a man to come in who could assess how they performed and the weak areas of their church. And in the process of going through their membership role, that's what they discovered. And it's because people don't need God. And so now we're beginning to see God do some different things. Um, yesterday was our first service back. And... Um, I think it's no mistake that, that God had to start up on Pentecost Sunday. And so it's an exciting time. But I feel like I've waited my whole life for this. You know, I, most guys that are approaching 70, which it seems like I was 20 yesterday, uh, are looking for retirement. I feel like we're just getting warmed up. And I believe the best is yet to come. Yes, I agree with you on that. I think the best is yet to come, and I believe there's a great revival coming. I don't actually believe it's coming. I believe it's here. Mm -hmm. I believe we're stepping into it. Ed, I, I want to ask you, too. You said that um, you're a balanced Pentecostal church. How have you done that? Because sometimes the larger you get, the more you 
if people are overly Pentecostal, you get them out of hand. Mm -hmm. And then if you overcorrect, then your church just becomes dead. And so how, how have you kept that balance? Right. Um, well, first of all, your people have to respect you as a pastor. And um, there has to be a little bit of the fear of God in them. Yes. Um, we've also taught in our church that we're not going to allow people to freelance in our services. Um, had people show up on a Sunday morning, and recently we had somebody drive like six hours that showed up and said God um, gave them a word for our church. And they wanted me to give them the platform. And I, I said, that's never going to happen. I said, we are a prophetic church. And that if God actually has something to say to us, he probably has enough people in the building that one of them could have heard from the Lord. And, um, you know, so we, we really teach our people to have divine order. But divine order does not mean man control. It means God control. And so we try to be real sensitive to the moving of the spirit. Um, there are going to be moments they might be few and far between. I think it just depends on how you conduct your services. Um, we're not going to have people uh, jumping up in the middle of service and saying, Yea, thus saith the Lord. I didn't allow it when I traveled in my meetings. God doesn't interrupt himself. And so we try to be um, compassionate and kind and gentle. And all, part of that is teaching your ushers how to, in an effective way, deal with a volatile situation and keep an eye on people and so um, we don't uh, we don't seem to deal with that now I think because we dealt with that at an earlier time um, at the same time we don't want to be so sedate or so controlled that the spirit of God can't move I want God to do whatever he wants but I, I also think that that God is a God of order and that he can accomplish. If you go online, you can watch some of the YouTube videos with uh, like um, Oral Roberts or A.A. A. Allen when they're conducting their healing crusades in tents. And you, have, you watch these magnificent healings that take place. But everything was in order. They had people in line. And Brother Roberts would be sitting in a chair or A.A. Allen would sit in a chair and somebody would come up that couldn't even walk and they would have a conversation with them and talk with them and just lay hands on them and say Lord in the name of Jesus we just are declaring divine healing the power of God is not in how loud you talk or how loud you shout or whether you shake the power of God comes from with inside and so the authority the devil doesn't respect volume or even intellect uh, in the scriptures he said that he said Paul I know and Jesus I know but who are you and these are seven boys who were in the house of the high priest they were raised in it but they had no relationship with Christ and so the devil knows who's who in the kingdom and so Paul he would just speak a word and uh, people were healed and I believe that um, we're going to see the greatest outpouring of the glory of God that that mankind has ever seen in these next few years. I completely agree with you. You were just talking about A. A. Allen and Oral Roberts and Pentecost and the spirit filled movement seemed to be almost at its peak there, besides in the book of Acts. It seemed to be so high and now we look around and it seems to kind of decline. The, like you were saying, people don't feel like they need God and certainly don't feel like they need the Holy Spirit. And so where do you see the Pentecostal movement going in the next couple of years? I feel like you kind of said it, but I want yeah. to hear more on what you think. Well, you know, God over the decades has moved in different facets. And sometimes we equate miracles as great revival, and that's not necessarily great revival. Uh, we've seen moves where... Um, the Spirit of God would manifest in that movement through divine healing, whether it was in the healing revivals in the 50s. Um, in the 70s, we've seen where the Spirit of God was revealed more through teaching. Um, we saw the great outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the, in the 80s, 
with the charismatic revival. That's how revival manifested. It was people getting the Holy Ghost. Uh, in, the, in the 90s, it seemed to be manifested more through the prophetic meetings. And you have these, these moves of God where prophecy and all of that began to happen. Uh, I think that where we're headed, those will not be the high points that we remember, even though all of those facets will be a part of what God's doing. I think this time it's just the presence of the Lord. Um, this generation needs an encounter with God. The church needs an encounter with God. And we, unfortunately, we worship the supernatural now. We worship worship. Right. We'll spend an hour and a half, you know, having young people lead us who don't know even know who they're singing about. And we call that worship but true worship is lifestyle it's not what you say and i believe that there are many things that god is bringing back into order in this hour so uh i don't think a lot of churches are going to survive coming out of the coronavirus especially those that were not built around god and have divine purpose i think that um god is removing the gray areas in america in the spirit realm uh, I think that um, we're going to see a lot of people who have not seen favor with God. All of a sudden, it's just going to begin to happen. Uh, I think we're going to see services begin to last. It's almost like we'll step out of time. Three o'clock in the afternoon, people will still be in the presence of the Lord. And uh, when God began to speak prophetically to me about shutting down things in our nation sports and different things um, we've seen that happen but the reason I think the Lord's doing it is is because he's removing distractions from people God's going to make America need him again and so the what concerns me about the coronavirus is it has not seemed to really produce a spiritual awakening we we hear a lot about let's get back on track let's get the economy revived let's get back to sports and let's get america back to work but i'm not hearing anything really in the spirit realm about the hunger for the presence of the lord or let's get god back in our nation and uh, <clears throat> i don't remember giving it uh, i have it on tape somebody a pastor sent it to me and 2008 I was in New York preaching in the middle of my preaching God began to speak prophetically and he verbatim said um, I'm sending a virus to America and that will kill millions of people and that the hospitals and the government will not have an answer for it only the church will um, this is not that because millions of people have not died there's something else getting ready to happen in the United States that's literally going to rock this nation to its very roots. And the government's not going to be able to fix it with a stimulus package or mass. Um, God is serious this time. And he's going to make people need him. And I don't think sports is ever going to recover uh, from what God has done because they took his day. And so I think we need to prepare for um, the masses coming back to the house of the Lord. And I don't know what all that entails, but um, we, I believe that uh, millions of people are going to get saved around the world. And this is not just nationally. This is a global thing that God is doing. And so um, I... I I think that uh, I know the Lord spoke this to me that starting in 2020 there would be a great move of God and that after 2024 uh, it's going to get very dark in the United States and in the earth and I don't know exactly what that means but I believe that we're very close to the second coming of Jesus Christ for the remnant. Um, I believe there is a catching away but I think it's a reward for everybody who has just paid the price and lived the life their whole life or you know since they've got saved they've been hungry for God and um, 
our president's going to be voted back in easily because God needs him in that office for through the year 2024. What happens after that, I don't know. Uh, but we need to redeem the time because God's up to something. And um, also the lukewarm that God has been warning for, for three years, um, things are going to get really bad for them. I've already seen it. People are going to lose their businesses. Uh, there's going to be great reversals because uh, God begged them and they wouldn't come. And I think there's another invitation beginning to go out. And the ministry of Christ was to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to open the eyes of the blind, deliverance to the captives, and the gospel to the poor. Uh, I believe that the Lord is beginning to send an invitation out to that element of people. And the other thing is this young generation from 35 and under, uh, they've never known the Lord, so God has to do something that gives them a divine encounter with their creator. Yes, I agree. I agree 100%. My generation, we want that, but we almost don't know what we want. Sure. Because we haven't ever tasted of it ourselves. Right. We're just going off of the stories of what the feast was. Yeah. And so I, I completely agree. And I think that's one reason why we're so drawn to what you're doing and what you speak because your prophecies come true. Mm -hmm. We've heard people say, thus saith the Lord, and nothing right. happened. And so people start not putting stock in that. But what you're saying, we're seeing. Right. And there's just a hunger for that real and to see God really move. And so I'm excited about what you said. Thank you. And I, I want to ask you, um, if you could speak to every young minister right now and say something to them, what advice would you give them? Uh, my advice to every young preacher is develop a prayer life, and that takes time. Anything that um, is worth having requires discipline, and the word disciple comes from discipline. And um, people tease me about the way I eat or, or whatever in the exercise, but I felt like as a young man that if I could control my flesh, it would translate into the spirit realm. And so as a very young man, I made a point to try to pray an hour a day. Not every time do I have great prayer, but it's the discipline of that. What happens is in a prayer life, most of my messages that I get, I get in prayer. And most of the time for me, God will just give me a spark. It might be a word or just a phrase that I have been reading, my daily Bible reading. It'll come alive. If I can just get a spark, then I can build a message around it. But that's the life source. And that comes out of relationship with God. And so uh, you have to define what success is before God. The Bible said that there were those who loved who believed in Christ but they loved the praises of men more than they loved the praises of God and there's great pressure on young men today because success in ministry is have you wrote a book how many people do you have in your church where are you preaching who do you know that's not success the greatest probably ministers that the earth has ever known probably nobody knows of they won't be revealed into eternity you know they just they live the life and so there are two things develop a prayer life and learn how to cultivate anointing because even revelation does not get in people's spirits it's titillating and people go wow that's i've never heard that before that's amazing um talent or being a great speaker does not get in people's spirits the only thing that gets in people's spirits is when the anointing and all anointing is is when the holy spirit starts doing it through you so learn how to remove everything from your life that grieves the holy ghost second thing is remove everything in your life that becomes an inhibitor to the holy spirit that when you step into the pulpit that you are just a vessel that the Holy Spirit flows through into those people because the privilege of standing before a crowd, like tonight in church, we have a lot of people that are going to make a real sacrifice to come here, to be in this service. It's my responsibility 
that we need to redeem that moment that when they come that they hear from God that they hear the voice of the Lord and that their spirits are touched and if you can get your if you can touch the spirit of somebody you can change your life and modern churches today are glorified daycares they're really they they're, they have state of the art facilities but they're full of babies and um we need to get back to a place that being saved does not mean you said I accept Christ as my Savior and signed a card but it means you had a divine encounter with the Lord you got filled with the Holy Ghost you know spirits of addiction were cast out and so uh, the move of God that's coming is going to be messy it's we're going to have churches we need to be prepared for people coming in who have piercings and tattoos and um, don't dress as sedate as we want that have alcohol on their breath or their and then on the other hand to have businessmen come in that are maybe worth millions but are bankrupt emotionally and need God to set them free there has to be that and the only way God has restricted himself to use men and if there's no men then there's no move of God or there's no women there's no move of God and so um, young men in this hour get in the word uh, find material that that you can read define what your calling is and your gift and then be good at that when I was younger <clears throat> I would listen to preachers that I really liked and didn't want to preach like them. And I found out that I couldn't. And, and then you're not good anyway when you do. Be content to be who God called you to be. And my style is different from other people's. I would like to be more calm or maybe be a great teacher. <clears throat> That's not what God called me to be. So I've learned to appreciate that and I've learned to honor the presence of God and learning also to stay in a realm of the spirit never allow yourself to get involved in anything that takes you out of that place to where you can no longer hear the voice of God it doesn't mean you can't watch TV it doesn't mean you can't go on the beach it just simply means that regardless of where you are in life you are still tapped in to hearing the voice of God and uh, I believe the Lord is raising up young men and women, but they have got to be willing to lay down their life for Christ. That's such good advice, such great advice. I mean, I just am really blown away by all that you said, and I think I, I see all this wisdom that's in you, and I, I have this other question. What pastors and leaders have poured into you and who do you watch like you were saying you watch some of those preachers online or or you still want to be like them who are some that you watched and that really poured into your life whether directly like as somebody who actually had an influence mm -hmm. and a place in your life and some people that you just watched um well recently we were talking with a couple and they were talking about if they had a mount rushmore who would be on that mountain and and I was listening to different ones, and they were naming people who were a great influence in their life. For whatever reason, um, I never had that. Um, my dad died when I was 12, and uh, I never had any strong father figure, even spiritually, that, that spoke into my life. Um, so whether that's a negative or a positive, it drove me closer to to seek in my eternal father I think it's wonderful to have men that can father you and help you you know through the rough spots um, maybe that's why I have such a heart for young men and, and young ministers is because I did not have it and so I had to learn it by the school of hard knocks um, I liked anybody that that was anointed um, I love David Wilkerson because he was prophetic um, there's some great preachers out there that I that um, that T.D. Jakes is a great preacher if you're just looking for straight up preaching um, he you know his style is different his culture is different 
but um, I, uh, growing up in Pentecost, there were some guys, you know, that I liked simply because that was all we were exposed to. I, I'd be sad to say I can't think of any national voices in America anymore. If you would think about it, there are no national voices that are speaking into our nation. Right. We don't have them. And um, we need God to raise up some men to a national level that can get a hold of the heart of the nation and pull them back into the presence of the Lord. I believe that God always, Scripture says he, he does it first in the natural and then the spirit. He raised up a Donald Trump who wasn't even a politician and made him a national leader. So I'm believing that maybe God can reach into that realm and pull up some men and women who have been validated through signs and wonders and, and the miracles. Um, putting 20,000 people in an auditorium and just going through a, a, an organized service, that's really not success. Right. Um, we, need, we, need, we don't have any preachers anymore. We have teachers. But you can't think on a national level, how many great preachers do you know that can preach the house down? Right. They're not out there. Because everybody has gone into the vein of to have a really big church, you got to be more sedate, you teach, you have series that last three months, you know what you're going to preach for the next three months. Um, I never know from week to week what I'm going to preach. I've got to preach Wednesday night at our church, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. So I'm constantly in the heavens, you know, reaching around, I'm trying to figure out, God, what are you going to do Wednesday, what are you going to do next Sunday? And uh, the beauty of, of serving God a long time is you have downloaded into you so much information that the Holy Ghost, once he gives you a thought, you can begin to pull from those files of all those years of study, and you can begin to put your message together. But we need preachers. We do. Uh, it didn't say by the foolishness of teaching or prophesying. It said by the foolishness of preaching. And, of course, preaching doesn't mean you have to be hollering and all of that, but there has to be. Uh, I think it was Jonathan Edwards who preached, perhaps, they say, one of the most profound messages ever. And it's, you can read it online. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. History says that as he was preaching, that people begin to hang on to the back of the pews and shake because they felt like they were falling into hell. Jonathan Edwards was almost blind, and he would have to get this close, and he read that message. He read it, and in a monotone delivery, and yet the power of God came through it in such a profound way that it wasn't his style. It was what was in him from those two or three years of praying over whales, that heaven opened and God just began to do it. And so in the hour that we're in, um, I'm, I'm believing that God will raise up men that the anointing of the Lord can flow through back into the congregation. Yes, I'm praying for that same thing. It's, it's neat that you say that. It's not really about our style. It's not really about us, really. It's just it's about us letting God work through us. Sure. Just, we're, just be the vessel and not put so much pressure on how you do it or how or how you say it but just allow him to speak through you right so that's that's also great advice i'm i love that and this is my last question um what is the most miraculous thing you've ever seen god do well i gotta put right at the top of the list donald trump being made president that is very true <laughs> um everything said it could not happen and uh, I, I had prophesied that he would, so I was really personally very happy that he became president. <laughs> I told my wife, says, he's not president, I'm going to have to quit preaching. So, um, I've seen a lot of just fi miracles, physical miracles. And um, I, I'm not sure. Everything from raising my dog from the dead um, that got hit by a car, literally dead. I, and I prayed over him and God raised him up to seeing God heal cancers and, um, you know, all kinds. I, I watched my daughter inadvertently um, swing a baseball bat full swing, and as she swung it, my five-year-old boy stepped into the swing, and she hit him full force with an aluminum baseball bat right here. 
and he hit the concrete. His face began to swell. He's bleeding profuse, profusely. Is he's out? His his nose to the side, and she's screaming. And I begin uh, to pray over him, and I begin to just to declare that the power of God would heal him. And I gave him up my arms, and I took him to the hospital, and they rushed him into the emergency room, and they come out pretty soon, and they said, uh, he's going to be all right, and he doesn't even have a broke nose. And we wound up taking him home. Um, evangelizing years ago we watched God do great things from being out of gas and the vehicle still run for another 50 miles traveling to Houston in the middle of the night dead broke um, pulling a trailer going up a hill in our old van um, we heard a loud explosion I pulled over put it in park got out of my van my van started rolling backwards down the hill I jumped back in it and jammed on the brakes um, <clears throat> and it's in park and it's still moving uh, transmission literally blew up so I've been preaching on faith my wife and I got out at 3 in the morning I laid hands on my van I told her I said we're going to ask God to make this thing work and <laughs> we commanded that that transmission to work I got back in that van and put it in drive I drove all the way to Houston and I drove 800 miles pulling a trailer back to Nashville. I took it to Mr. Transmission. He called me, he said, uh, if you drove those many miles like you said you did, he said, you must know somebody in heaven. He said, because it looks like a bomb went off inside your transmission and it's totally demolished. So, you know, I know God does miracles, whether it's financial. Uh, we, my wife and I were challenged by God for a year and a half to give 50% of our gross to him. And it got so bad financially that uh, we had our electricity shut off twice. We had our phone shut off. We got down to where we'd have $2, uh, and that's all we had to. We were behind our house, and um, we... Um, we did that for a year and a half. Bank of America was getting ready to foreclose on our home. But I knew God told me to give half to him. And so um, we went someplace and we got an amazing offering. My offerings most of the time were seven, eight hundred dollars And uh, <clears throat> we were three months behind in our house. And the pastor took up an offering and he came to me and he said, this is the biggest offering this church has ever taken up in 42 years. And he gave me 6500 and some change. And I went home and we paid bills, caught up on our house. And then at the end of the year and a half, we were getting ready to lose our home again. And God spoke to me and said, you don't have to give 50% anymore. So we went back to giving 20% of our gross. Two weeks later, I think it was, I had a man ask me to lunch, me and my wife. We went to lunch with him, and he said, can you come by my office before you go home? We walked into his office and sat down, and his secretary brought him an envelope. He gave it to me, and he said, this is to pay off your house. And he gave me a check for $125,000. And uh, there was enough in there for me to pay 20% tithes and pay off my home. And what God was showing me was, it doesn't matter how desperate it looks. Not only that, we live in a home that's three times better than that now. When we went to buy, we had no money. And I told her, I said, our credit's shot because of the year and a half of how we paid our bills. And when the bank pulled up my credit, I had A1 credit. And so um, I've had a son that was born over three months premature, they said would not live. Um, he's totally healthy today at 26. I have a 42-year-old boy that was gay for 20 years. And today he's full of the Holy Ghost, has two kids, been married 12 years. So I'm emotional, sorry. Um, but to think of the power of God and what God does. We take our limitations off of the Lord and for me it's not down here that matters it's where we're going 
so the Lord told me years ago he said while you're down here you're working for me he said this is about me he said heaven's about you and so until then we'll make that time count wow wow I wish you would write a book just on all the miracles because I could listen to those all day I really feel like this interview has just built my faith and encouraged me, and I hope that it's encouraged all of you. I know that it has because it is just such a blessing, everything that you shared. I thank you for tuning in with us. Remember to tune in every Monday at 7 o'clock and tune in for the next Insight Edition. Mm -hmm.